many of us have been guilty in falling to the trap of credit card debt and the challenges of climbing ourselves out of it. Today's guest is no different, but her mom was very clever in her approach. Don't miss it. Bienvenida to the Her Dinero Matters podcast, a mixed language podcast hosted by me, Jen Hemphill, to help you become the reign of your money and love your dinero more. If you are needing some inspiration and encouragement at this very moment, you have come to the right place. Gracias por compartir este tiempo conmigo. Now let's jump in to today's Dose of Money Confidence. How's it going? This is Jen Hempel, your host. Credit cards. They can be so appealing, right? Because they are easy to use. And at the beginning, when you're about to apply or you just got it, they seem so harmless because credit card companies aren't necessarily calling you and asking for a full payment. Heck, if you don't pay in full, that's how they make their money off of you. So it benefits them. But you as a consumer, on the other hand, that not paying in full can put you in a tough spot and in a vicious cycle of paying more and more interest. Today's guest is no stranger to this. You will hear her story and what trade-off she made with her mom that involved signing a contract. You will hear what happened as a result of this experience. And I think if you're a parent, it gives you some insight and a way to teach credit card responsibility to your kid. Also, in the post-interview, I'm going to share with you something to always have front and center when getting a new credit card. Well, let me share with you about today's guest, Maribel Quesada Smith. She is a video and podcast producer with over 16 years of expertise developing meaningful content. Her TV credits include producing shows for Discovery Family of Networks, Netflix, Oxygen, and a e among others. She's currently a producer and co-host of the popular Pulso podcast, and she helps entrepreneurs, startups, and growing brands build deeper connections with their ideal customers through meaningful video and audio content. Lista, let's go meet Maribel. Welcome. Bienvenida, Maribel. I'm so thrilled to have you with us. You were behind the scenes in Financially Strong Latina, putting the video together, you know, just basically keeping us in line with all the video production. So I'm really excited to talk to you today and just learn more about you because I got to learn more of the professional Maribel. Now (laughs) I get to learn and be able to ask questions on the other side of Maribel. So welcome. Thank you so much, Jen. I'm usually on the other side of the table. So this is a little nerve wracking for me. Oh, you'll be good. You'll be good. I'll try (laughs) to take it easy on you. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate that. So Let's start with your money story. So take us back in time, Maribel, to your upbringing, your experiences, anything that you saw, you heard that had to do with money that really made an impact and maybe has made an impact until today. So talk to us about that. There have been many, many stories, obviously, in my life. I've experienced a lot of different money stories and money journeys, but some of the ones that have really stuck with me, for example, is when I was growing up, I was around, I think, 15 years old. And my mom finally came to me one day and was like, look, everybody in this family has responsibilities, including your brother and your sister who are older than I am. Your responsibility, one of your responsibilities is going to be balancing the checkbook for the family. So she taught me how to pay the bills. I was responsible for writing all the checks because back then, not to date myself, (laughs) before bill pay, before electronic bill pay, I had to write checks manually. So she taught me how to write checks. She taught me how to write the checks out to the bills, to the utility companies. 
and then I would have to keep a log in the checkbook. Do you remember how inside the checkbook you have an actual log, like a balance yep. sheet, a yep. paper balance sheet? Okay, I had to manage that. So I would write debit for, you know, 50 some dollars for the water bill or whatever it was. And then credit for, you know, a deposit of a paycheck from my dad or my mom, whatever. I was in charge of that. I mean, not solely to be fair, like she had most of the control, but I was in charge of making sure that I paid the bills on time and that I would register them on the checkbook. So that's one of the big ones. You know what? I have to say, in all of these years of interviews and just hearing the experiences of my guests, you were the first one that (laughs) as a kid were helping your parents pay the bills. This is so awesome. All right, go ahead. (laughs) Well, thankfully, they didn't make me actually help pay the bills with my money that I earned. (laughs) (laughs) That was actually really nice of them. But yeah, no, it was a good learning experience because when I got to college, I was one of the only people who knew how to balance a checkbook. And so in college, fast forward a few years, I decided to get my first credit card. And my mom, of course, was very much against that because she knew that I was one of those people who spent every dime she earned. Since I was in high school and I had like my little side jobs, I would always spend everything I had. And it was normally on shoes, clothes, and going out. So she was like, don't get a credit card. You don't know how to manage that. I'm very worried about that. I got it anyway because I could. And I was only allowed, I think my limit was $500 because I didn't have a credit history, but the bank gave me a $500 credit card. I was so excited. So I bought a few things online and back then online started happening. So I bought a few things and then I got in debt. I maxed out the credit card and I soon found out that I couldn't pay it off fast enough because I didn't really have a job. I was in college. I was like working tutoring gigs and things like that on the side. So My mom came to me and said, okay, you want a computer, you want a laptop, I will buy you this laptop, but here's the deal. She wrote up a contract and she said, you need to sign this contract. It says that if you don't pay your balance, your credit balance in full every month, your credit card, I will take the computer back. And so I was like, what? Okay, I guess I'll sign this, whatever. (laughs) I can handle it. You know, it's not a big deal. I'm not going to get myself in debt. Again, because at that point, then she had helped me figure out how to pay it off. So I paid it off. So then here comes fall quarter of my, I think it was then senior year or junior year. And I get myself in debt again. And she found out and she was like, I'm taking the computer back because that was the deal. You can't have the computer if you're not going to be able to pay the credit card off every month. That was her biggest lesson was like, if you have a credit card, you need to pay it off every month in whole, like don't do the minimum payment. And one month, for some reason, I couldn't get it all done. I think I had like $100 in there that I didn't get paid off. She was so mad. And she really was like, I'm taking it back. But I begged her and I made a promise. I said, give me two weeks. I will pay it off in two weeks. I promise. And it won't happen again. And it never happened again for as long as I was under her management, so to speak, because, you know, you're in college. (laughs) She was still helping me pay bills and things. So I had to follow her rules and it didn't. It didn't happen again. I was a lot better about it. And it was a big lesson. Some people might say that it was kind of like a harsh one, but honestly, for me, it was a really important lesson because I didn't know how to manage credit or money very well. And I have to say that it still took me some years to get back, to actually like get on track and not allow myself to get into credit card debt again. Because later on, after college, you know, you get out of college, you have your first job, you think you have stuff going on, start spending again. And so it took me a couple more tries to get it together, but I finally did. (laughs) And fortunately, you said your credit limit was 500. Yeah. (laughs) Which thankfully, because can you imagine if your credit limit was more than that? Jen, I have a friend who graduated college. She was a year older than I was and, or she is still a year older than I am. And the day that she graduated, she told me, I have $10,000 worth of credit card debt, credit card debt, not student loans, credit card debt. And she was 22 years old. That to me was a very, very big wake up call because I realized that I was fortunate to have a minimum amount of credit allowance to my name, but also that I needed to get it together because I was not about to be in $10,000 worth of credit card debt. 
Right. I know with my dad, he taught me, and I don't know in what way he told me, but for me, if I were to have a credit card, I was supposed to pay it in full. Like that was like ingrained in me yeah. and there was no other option. I'm like, okay, if I'm going to have a credit card, I will play it off in full. And fortunately, I've been doing that, but I don't even know what I wish I could hear over the conversation that he had because it was just whatever he said, it was just ingrained. Credit card, you pay in full. You know, just charge what you are able to pay at the end of the month. And that's what I've been doing because they've had credit card debt. And I think it was just his experience. Maybe he shared something. I don't know. But I just will always remember when he sat down with me to have the money talk. Yeah. <laughs> Part of the, the, was the credit card. Well, you know, what's interesting to me is that the money talk was actually more emphasized between me and my mom than the sex talk. I got like nothing when it came to the sex talk. It, she literally sat me down in the kitchen table when I was in sixth grade. And she said, when a man and a woman are in love and they're married, they can <laughs> sleep together and have a baby. Period. And then my money talk was like over and over again and into detail. She had me balancing checkbooks and all kinds of stuff. But no, no. When it came to sex, it was like, uh, we're not talking about that. <laughs> Guess who had the sex talk with me? Who? My dad. <gasps> oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know and about that. With my brother. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> Thanks, dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you. I have to say, if your mom is listening, I want to applaud you, mom, because <laughs> you did just so awesome. I love it. I have to meet her someday. I really do. Yes. No, she did. <laughs> she did it. a good job when it came to the finances. Honestly, she taught me well. But I also have to give a shout out to my sister because later on when I said, remember, I told you that after college, I kind of slid back a little bit. I had a much higher credit card allowance or I guess, limit. And I think I started kind of doing the whole minimum balance pay for a few months after college. I started doing that. And I kind of got myself into a little bit of debt where like I had an ongoing balance of like $1,500, right? Which isn't good. So my sister introduced me to Dave Ramsey and she gave me his full audiobook. I forget what it's called, but that one audiobook that a lot of people have read from many years ago. And I have to say, like, she had a big impact in that because her giving me that and giving me some pointers also, she's actually incredibly good with money, helped me realize what I was doing wrong. And so then I learned, okay, these are the things that I can do to pay off this credit card debt and never have to worry about it again. And ever since then, I must have been 25. Ever since then, I have not gotten myself, knock on wood, <laughs> into credit card debt ever. Like, I've always been able to pay off my credit card bills completely every month. And that's honestly a very big source of pride for me because it's something that really allows me to feel very relaxed and feel a lot better about where I am in life and also just not have to stress so much. You know, when things might get tight, you don't have to worry about this looming over your head. Like, oh my God, how am I going to pay this credit card bill off? Like, at least that's one less thing that you have to worry about. Right. And I want to go back too, because you mentioned in your upbringing, you were in charge of writing out the checks for the bills, balancing the checkbook. How many siblings do you have? Yeah, I have two siblings. Okay, two siblings. So what were their roles or did they have roles around with money? I have no idea. So my sister's four years older than I am. My brother is eight years older than I am. So honestly, I'm not sure that he had much to do with our family finances other than helping. There was an expectation at, at a certain age, they had to give like a certain amount of money to the family if they were living there. So my brother, you know, and sister, I think each had to give like $100 a month when they were in their late teens, college and stuff. So I don't know what he what my brother learned from my parents, but I know that he's also pretty good at managing his money as well. And my sister... I think she just kind of learned a little bit of the stuff that my mom taught us from just managing the family money because my mom was able to manage little, whatever little might have come in at certain points because we had really good times, you know, really good periods of time where we were financially doing well. And then we had really tight times. So we saw how my mom managed the budget very, very, very carefully 
to where it didn't matter where we were in life. Maybe they couldn't afford to take us on vacation or to buy us Christmas presents one year, but we always had everything we needed. Right. And that was very, very crucial to my upbringing because I can honestly tell you that I do have a sense of safety when it comes to that. Because my childhood felt safe in the sense of I always had food on the table, I had clothes to wear, and I had my books to go to school and a way to get to school. Because I had the basics, I do have the privilege of living more safely. Like I feel more relaxed and less anxious around money than I think a lot of people. Because when you have that scarcity when you're young, I can only imagine what that creates as an adult. There are other things that I have scarcity mentality around, but it's not around money, thankfully. And I think it has a lot to do with that, how well she managed the budget when we were younger. That is an interesting reflection because I had that scarcity and it was money. That was huge, 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 huge. So that is interesting that it wasn't scarcity is around other areas, but not money. That's awesome. Yeah. You all know I am a Latina business owner. You also might know that Latina women start their own businesses at six times the national rate. So it's wild to me that there hasn't been a reliable payroll app available in Spanish. Until now. Roll by ADP is the first ever chat-based payroll app in Spanish. It's backed by ADP, the most experienced payroll provider in the U.S., and specifically designed for small business owners. With a Roll app, you can pay any type of employee in any state, including 1099 and W-2 workers, right from your mobile device and in less than a minute. Funds are deposited directly within 24 hours so your employees get paid fast. You also get 24-7 live chat support in Spanish or English, plus built-in compliance alerts so you can run payroll with confidence. Stop stressing about payroll and get Roll by ADP for your small business. Try it for free for three months by visiting rollbyadp.com slash her dinero. I mean, like I said, we didn't always have a lot of stuff and we definitely were not well off many times. <laughs> but I don't know, whatever she did, she just made it work. Like she figured out a way and she was very, very resourceful. And I think that has a lot to do with it. Like she taught me how to be resourceful, how to work with what I have. That helps you even when you make a little bit of money. You might think it's not enough, but like the way that you can get creative with it and what you can do to make things stretch, it's pretty impressive what some people do out there. I'm not even that good at it, but I've seen some friends do a lot with little. And it's cool to have that learning in your life. Absolutely. Now talk to us about your experience. You emigrated from Mexico to the U.S. at about 12 years old. So what do you remember observing and seeing your parents just navigate the financial system here in the U.S.? Because they, from Mexico, where it's different, to the United States, that there's different options and that they have to learn. So what do you remember? The biggest thing that I remember is that they didn't have a credit history. So in Mexico, when we were growing up, which was in the 90s, we came here in 96, there was no real credit. Like you either bought your house with cash or you borrowed from your family members somehow. Some people did borrow with banks, but that was very rare. Most people would buy their houses in cash or buy like property in cash. And so coming here, they learned, oh, you need credit for everything. Even if you don't believe in having to get in debt, the United States is built in a way, the system here is built in a way that you kind of need that credit score regardless because you can't even rent a car without some sort of credit card or something like that. And so they learned that quickly and it took them a while to build that up. I think somehow they have a friend who maybe co-signed, I believe, for my dad's first credit card. And that was a way that they started building credit. But I I do remember specifically that, you know, it was a very tricky situation because the first couple of years, they didn't really have much credit history and we wanted to buy a house. And when it came time to buy the house, man, I forget, like, it, I think it took an extra six months or so to get all the paperwork and all the things that they were asking of my parents. 
to be able to vouch for them so that they didn't need to have another co-signer. And that was a really big learning experience. But I think also because they had to jump through so many hoops and had to learn about building credit scores and so forth, my parents were really good at having good credit scores because they were very careful as to how they built it. They had the mentality from Mexico of like, you don't get in debt because it's just bad news. All the interest rates were super, super high there. So it was just like a no-no, like you just can't afford it. And then coming here, credit was so easily available at times, but they already knew that there was a big downfall. So I think that helped them a lot in keeping in line, I guess, with their values of not getting into major debt or at least retail debt, credit card debt, you know, which is so common. Right. Now, there was one point in your life that you love to spend because we know that (laughs) when you had the credit card (laughs) in college, you got yourself in a little bit of credit card debt. But there was also a time, and I don't know if it was during this course of college, that you like to spend on fashion. But there was a turning point. Tell us about this. Yes, I love fashion. Anyone who knows me knows that I am stylish and I love it. (laughs) And so (laughs) that was one of my biggest downfalls. I used to spend a lot of money just buying shoes, clothes. My closet was packed to the max. I mean, I had to have things in boxes, you know, or in totes sometimes because I didn't have enough space. It was getting ridiculous. And so I think I started learning more about just the effects of fashion in the world and not only in our economy, but also in our environment. And I watched a couple documentaries. I read a few books on fashion and I started to understand the detrimental effect that fast fashion has in our environment. For example, like just fast fashion, when I talk about fast fashion, I'm referring to clothing lines or stores that sell a lot of clothes for cheap. When we started seeing that, I feel like that wasn't really in existence back in the day, like in the 80s and 90s. I don't remember there being a lot of options for buying clothes on the cheap. And then all of a sudden come the 2000s and Forever 21 pops up and all these other stores that are fast fashion start coming online and people are like, whoa, I can buy a shirt for $5 or $10. That's crazy. That's amazing. And so because of that, I started consuming a lot more. Well, then I realized that there's a big detrimental effect because the more you produce, the more water you use, the more emissions you produce. The factories are throwing out a ton of dirty water into rivers and the oceans. They're spilling out dyes from the colors and pigments, like all of that goes into the water, into our oceans. And so it's detrimental to the environment, but it's also detrimental to the people because, you know, you've heard of sweatshops. So you have people making these clothes or these shoes and they're making them in really tight conditions because they're pressured to provide a certain amount of things or or a certain amount of items in a short period of time. So they're under really bad working conditions. So the effect is just bad all around on people and on the environment. If you're a good person with a conscience, I feel like you have to understand the effect that your choices have on humanity. And I had to come to terms with that. Like my purchasing decisions have a big effect on other people that I don't even know. And I started thinking about that and it really got to me. So obviously, when you also talk about your wallet, then it has another effect as well. You're like, oh yeah, I'm also spending a lot of money on this. So I had to do something different. And I decided one year to just go off retail completely. I should say going off of traditional retail completely. And I challenged myself to do a year of consignment shopping only. I was like, okay, Maribel, if you have the bug or the itch to go shop, because it was almost an addiction sometimes, then the only thing you can do is do consignment shopping or like thrift store, thrift store, consignment stores, anything like that, that's been used or previously loved, you're allowed to shop at, but nothing new, no shoes, nothing, nothing. So for a year I did that. And it was an exhilarating experience because I challenged my creativity. I was like, Oh, what can I find here? Oh my God, that's such a cute skirt. Maybe I can pair that with this, these shoes that I already own that I haven't worn in six months. (laughs) So It made me a lot more conscious about my budgeting, but also about the way that I looked at purchasing things, reusing things, and not just throwing stuff out, looking for quality over quantity. I cleansed my closet. I went through and got rid of so many things 
donated them, gave them to people that I knew that needed them, things like that. And I started over with just consignment for a year. And that year was very powerful for me because it really allowed me to reflect on the choices that I was making. And it allowed my creativity to kind of flourish and gave me some ideas of things that I could do that didn't involve necessarily spending a lot of money on clothes and shoes. And I want to go, if we can, dig into not just your love for fashion, but you mentioned that you felt like it was almost an addiction. Did your love for fashion just start because you liked the clothes and then it eventually went into just continuously buying and buying and buying? Or how do you think that came about? Oh my God, are you my therapist? Because that's such a deep question for me. I don't I'm curious. No, no, that's a great question. I feel like it's a multifaceted answer. I think that there were different things going on. One, self-confidence. So I drew a lot of my self-confidence from my appearance. I was taught that as a kid from a very early age. I saw that in my grandmother, my aunts, my mom, everybody kind of very much put emphasis on their appearance. And they were always nicely dressed and put together. So that was very important for me. I felt like in order to feel myself or feel confident, I needed to look my best. And so I think that was one of the reasons. But also, I had like this hole that I was trying to constantly fill. There were certain things in my life that were missing, whether it was self-love or love from other people. And I think that the clothing and the shoes and the acquirement of things made me feel like I had something that made me valuable in some way. I sought value outside of myself, and that had a lot to do with my purchasing decisions. And to be honest, I think that sometimes I still do that occasionally. Like I still have to check myself sometimes and be like, all right, am I spending money right now because I'm stressed and anxious and I want to distract myself from something else? Am I looking online to see what else I can buy because I'm trying not to cope with other things that are more important? Because honestly, that happens sometimes. Sometimes they call it retail therapy for a reason. People oftentimes mask other things by spending money. And I think that that happened to me a lot. Yeah. And I think that comes in the form of retail therapy, food, food. like mm -hmm. that's me, food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how I do it. Or some other way. I mean, so for yeah. some people, yeah. it's, what is it called? When you go to the casino? Yeah, gambling. Gambling or drugs. You know, any drug, yeah. Yeah, all sorts of things. So I, I think definitely brought up some good points. And I'm glad, you know, it's good to hear you say sometimes you have to catch yourself and you have to question. And that's the part that's hard to do because sometimes you're just on this robotic mode because that's what you default to. And that step to take yourself out of that default mode to question that and stop it. It's the harder part. <laughs> yeah. And for me, my decision to curve my shopping wasn't entirely based on financials and me trying to save money. I mean, that has an effect, of course, and it was definitely a motivator. But my decision was also about just changing the way that I looked at life and my values, like what's more important, things or experiences? I would rather go on a big vacation than go shopping. You know, that has shifted my mindset now, honestly. I will say that I've noticed my closet is way smaller than most people's now. Not in size, like physical size, but in contents. And when I look at it, it makes me proud because I see things hanging on my closet that I've had for years. And I've noticed that I've slowly stopped buying things that don't last very long. You know, the cheap clothes, I hate to say this, but sure, you might buy a shirt for $10, $20 today, but I promise you, it's not going to last you as long as something of better quality. Now, that doesn't say that just because you're going to spend $100 on something, it's of the best quality. That's not always the case, unfortunately. But I do notice that when I spend money on something of quality, it 
lasts and not just like in the sense that it physically lasts, but it lasts in my wardrobe. Like I'm able to use it more. I'm able to combine it with different things. I find more uses for it. And I don't know if it's maybe because I'm like, I spent a lot of money on that thing. So I'm going to use the hell out of it. Or it's because it just inspires me to be more creative about the way that I use it so that I get my money's worth. But either way, I do think that it's been positive that I have very much stayed away from fast fashion for years now and really focused on quality over quantity. I love that. I try to do that too. I just don't like going shopping. (laughs) (laughs) Not everybody does. Oh, I don't like it. I detest it. But anyways, well, I want to wrap it up with, because at the beginning I shared that you did the video production for Financially Strong Latina. And I'm just curious myself, what led you to be in that field of video production? What was it that led you to that? Rejection, to be honest. I was rejected from journalism school twice. And because of that, my college counselor said to me, have you ever thought about production? What about being on the other side of the camera? You have more control. You get to make creative choices. You get to run a show, depending on what you're doing. You get to run different productions. You can write. You can direct. There are so many things you can do being on the other side of the camera. And eventually, if you wanted to, you could also be in front of the camera. You could make things that have you in it. And honestly, that was like, oh, that was an eye-opening moment for me because I didn't know that there were other options. Originally, I just really wanted to be in broadcasting and I wanted to be on-air talent. But because I got rejected twice, I had to figure out another way. And so I did. And I'm very happy with that choice because honestly, I never look back. I love what I do. I love being a producer. I get to create amazing content for all types of different people, companies, networks. I've produced shows on television. I've produced documentaries full length. I have worked on short form content, virtual conferences like Financially Strong Latina. And It has always been very rewarding for me to have the ability to envision something and then see it come to life all the way through. And I think that, honestly, that's been why I continue to do it. It's not always easy, and it hasn't always been easy for me. It's been an up and down career, but I have to say that I've learned how to manage it to make it work for me as well. Because sometimes this industry can really take a lot out of you and it can make you hate life. And I've figured out a way to manage it better and to turn things around to where I'm not the one giving everything for somebody else. I'm giving something and people are appreciating it, but I'm also owning a lot of the content that I'm creating now. And that has really made a difference in my life. It makes me feel a lot more proud about the things that I create and produce and Yeah, I hope to keep doing it for a long time. Rejection. That is interesting. (laughs) That's what led you in. Kudos to your counselor, because I don't even remember my high school counselor or anything. So there are some, you know, counselors that do such a fantastic job and others that I don't know if they do. (laughs) Yeah, I know. (laughs) Because obviously mine wasn't memorable. Sorry. (laughs) You know, that is awesome that that counselor got you to think and okay, maybe journalism isn't, but there's another way. And I love when people do that. So thank you so much, Maribel, for being here. It was just so much fun getting to know the other side of Maribel. So thank you so much. This was fun. (laughs) Thank you, Jen. It was a pleasure. I love this conversation with Maribel, and I hope that you did as well. Of course, I'm personally biased. I'm going to be upfront because I have gotten to know her and work with her, as you have heard earlier, with Financially Strong Latina. I thought, though, it was so clever of her mom of how she intervened when she saw Maribel getting herself into credit card debt and not paying it off in full. Her mom knew Maribel well enough and knew that This was a risk her daughter was getting herself into because of her history with spending money. I thought that it was also key how she only had a $500 credit limit. Something to consider not just for your kids, but if you yourself are starting to build some credit, they may offer you more, but do you really need all that credit? 
It may seem like an obvious thing, but depending on your credit history, if you have a really good one, they're going to want to offer you a high credit limit. We tend to want to just accept it and move on with our lives, but my key point is to define what the purpose of the credit card is going to be for you and let that guide how much of a credit limit you're going to accept. It's like when you go shopping for a home, you go for that pre-approval for the mortgage and they pre-approve you for loans that are way more than you need and sometimes more than you really can afford. So I wanted to give you that food for thought, especially when it comes to taking out credit cards. Make sure that you just don't accept the credit limit they're giving you. Only take the credit limit that is sufficient for you, for your needs, and that you can be responsible for and paying off in full every single month. You can connect with Maribel at Maribel. QS, which is for quesadasmith.com. I will have that link in today's show notes. And I really encourage you to connect with her. She's definitely a lot of fun. Now, Maribel mentions fast fashion and being more environmentally friendly. If you want to learn more about that, make sure to check out our past episode, which is episode 231 with Kami Strashnoy, who works in the fashion industry. And we will also link that up in the show notes. If you love this episode and this conversation, I would love it if you could do two things for us. Share this with a friend, family member, a coworker, and review. You can leave a written review on the podcast, on Apple Podcasts, or if you're listening on Spotify, you can just rate us by giving us stars, the number of stars you deem we deserve, and you can go up to five stars. I don't know about you, but I personally look at reviews to help me determine whether I buy something or with podcasts, whether I listen to it. These reviews will not only help grow the show, but what mostly matters to you is that it continues to help us bring quality guests and even bigger guests. Those bigger guests will want to know that the show that they are thinking about being a guest on is legit. So of course, they're going to look at those reviews. Now we make it easy for you by going to the resource section of today's episode. Next week, we will meet another powerhouse Latina, Gigi Diaz. And all I'm going to say about that conversation is that if you are in need of a mindset check or someone to give you a swift kick, that swift kick you need, don't miss out next week. Bueno, pues that is everything. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to tune into the show. Be sure to check out the show notes over at jenhemphill.com forward slash 321. That is jenhemphill.com forward slash 321. One. Remember that being the reina of your money starts at this very moment simply by claiming it. I believe in you and so should you. Nos hablaremos el próximo jueves.